much, uh, Nathan. Thank you very much for coming. The way Nathan framed the topic, uh, if you've seen the flyer or if you saw the email handouts, he, he, as he said in his own talk, he identifies uh, modernity with capitalism and he calls for a revolutionary end to modernity, which would mean then uh, a revolutionary end to overcoming of capitalism. If though you uh, redefine, which is a, you know, on one level a perfectly laudable project, if you redefine modernity though in a slightly different way, and I'm going to emphasize the category of revolution as itself a very distinctive and important transformative category of modernity, then you could read Nathan's call as a kind of revolutionary end to revolution, which is a lot less appealing, at least for me. So uh, that's in a sense the point of departure here, was to sort of argue with this idea of the end, emphasize instead the modernity of revolution as a project to continue, perhaps precisely not then to complete, but a project that is in some important and significant sense already underway, and that we have, uh, we have a lot to learn from how that project has been begun, how it's started, how it's continued, how it's run into impasses, how it's run into contradictions and obstacles. And that's really from that history, I think, that we need to orient our own uh, understanding of revolutionary action today. So that's a little bit of the point of departure. The, the title then, Continuing the Revolution, that has three, three little words in it, and I'll start with them. And the first is just to remember that uh, revolution is an important category of, um, of, of, of the modern, however it's defined. Uh, so if you take a pretty canonical account like Reinhard Kasselik's in his Futures Past, the third chapter of that book is called The Modern Concept of Revolution, and it lists a series of attributes that I think would be pretty uncontroversially shared, accepted as characteristic of a modern concept of revolution. So the ancient notion of revolve, you know, revolution of the stars or a cycle of repetition is replaced by something that involves a break, something that can accelerate, something that's different from a merely reformist or gradual process of change, something that problematizes its own relation to the past, that anticipates the future, that involves something that, as it proceeds, becomes increasingly universal until it concerns uh, transformation at a world scale of humanity as a whole, and something that is bound up one way or another with its own ongoing continuity, the question of its own permanence or uninterrupted quality, which itself is a term that Babeuf uses more or less explicitly in the, at the end of the uh, it's kind of classical French Revolution, 1795-96, and it comes back again in 1830, and it echoes all through the 19th century, what it is to continue uh, the French Revolution. Uh, so in, in that sense, uh, and I think if you were to draw up a list of categories of modernity, revolution would have to figure pretty high on the list, at least for me. Uh, so it's, it, and it's to remember that the revolution, in a sense, before it even affirms itself as modern, it negatively declares the old order as ancien, precisely, right? The French Revolution is the moment that consigns an entire history to uh, a sort of political antiquity and holds out at the same time the promise of a project of organized around these sloganistic uh, terms, equality, uh, liberty, and a fraternity or solidarity. It's also something that is a revolution, of course. It's not a matter of reform or gradual progress. It's something that's achieved by direct popular mobilization and pressure, and that is imposed on a highly resistant political system. The readings of the revolution, Tocqueville, Marx, to some extent, that read it as uh, something that was already ongoing, the continuity of a project that is not exactly a revolutionary one, but something around, say, the consolidation of a, a mode of production, the bourgeois revolution, <coughs> or the consolidation of the state, which it is for Tocqueville, the consolidation of the bureaucratic state, the eclipse of aristocratic resistance to that state. Uh, these things fail to grasp, I think, the, the actual revolutionary dimension of the revolution. Of course, that's exactly what Tocqueville in particular is trying to do. So you thought it was a revolution, you deluded fools. It wasn't. It was just a, you know, a kind of <coughs> slightly explosive moment in the history that began a while ago, accelerated with Louis XIV, and is ongoing uh, to this day. So it involves... You have to make a decision there. It's something that Francois Furet emphasizes in his uh, otherwise very reactionary book on the French Revolution, Pensée la Révolution Française, Interpreting the French Revolution. He says you have to make a choice between whether you think the revolution as a revolution, which involves some reference to the intentions, consciousness, will, actions on, of the actors of the revolution. And that's broadly what Michelet does, for example, as at least the person he associates it with. It's certainly what the revolutionary actors themselves would think they're doing, of course or whether you go the line of Tocqueville, where you say intentions are basically deluded and deceived, 
we have to understand the real process, in Tocqueville's case, the process of the consolidation of state institutions, and that is what is at stake. And if you, as soon as you do that, it's not a revolution anymore. It's a substantial structural transformation, but it's not a properly revolutionary one, at least not in the sense of an emancipatory practical project. So that's the first thing, to affirm that there was indeed a revolution, uh, and it starts specifically with the French Revolution, that there's something qualitatively different that separates the French Revolution from the American Revolution, where there's a transfer of power from one elite to another, but not, I think, a fundamental revolution in the social uh, sense that's distinctive about the French Revolution. The French Revolution understood also something that spills very quickly into the revolutions in other contexts and other places, particularly in Haiti, but then it's taken up again in different parts of Europe, and then uh, again through, say, the Commune, which itself then sets the stage for the Russian Revolution, later for the Chinese Revolution, but there's a kind of continuity. So that's my second point here, is that the term, that, that uh, article, the, definite article, continuing the revolution, this question of the, the vexed, problematic, internally divided uh, unity of the revolution as the dimension of historical action. Uh, it's something that is taken for granted by the French revolutionaries themselves. Robespierre says, for example, a couple of years in, he says, half the, wor the revolution of half the world has been finished, you know, has been undertaken, essentially the rest of the world has to catch up, has to do its, has to do its job. And there's a sense that's very important that it's not the French Revolution or the Haitian Revolution or the Russian Revolution, that in each of these cases, or the Chinese Revolution, in each of these cases, it's the revolution that happens to be happening for the moment and in this particular place here and now. But it's not French in any significant, specific way. The language doesn't matter. The place in fact doesn't itself that much matter. Perhaps the concentration of power in Paris matters. That's a slightly different issue, though. But in principle, it's a universal revolution. And the idea, very quickly, is that it should spread and spill out over time and space until eventually it becomes a universal revolution. Exactly the same thing happens in Haiti. It's not a Haitian revolution, it's a revolution against slavery and against a certain, a, a, a certain configuration of racism and exploitation. It happens to happen in this particular island, but uh, in principle it spills out over, over, the, uh, over the Caribbean and over, in fact, over the world as a whole. So one of the first things that the Haitian revolutionaries do is to declare that anybody who wants to fight against slavery can become Haitian and just come to this island to join in this particular fight. They then lend important support for Bolivar and so on. And the Haitian revolution is always understood as a contribution to what would be a global and fully universal revolution. So that motif in the Russian revolution, of course, understood emphatically for the first several years as the revolution that happens to be happening in Russia. The idea that it could be contained and limited and forced back into socialism in their own country and so on is, of course, a major and highly consequential shift, and it wasn't one that Lenin or Trotsky uh, ever contemplated before then. Uh, and like, you know, you could say the same thing about Gram what Gramsci's doing in Turin and so on in the years following. So that's another term. The, the, now that doesn't mean there's only one uniform, rigidly defined revolution. Of course, in Haiti, in France, in Russia, in China, in Cuba, these are very different contexts. The obstacles to the equality and freedom and solidarity at issue are in each case different. Those differences are precisely the work of strategic action. So it's not to say it's uniform, but there's something that holds it together as a revolutionary project. Which is why then, third point, we can talk about continuing it. Uh, continuing, uh, and we have to, there's sort of two aspects to this. One, that there is indeed a legacy from the past. And for me, importantly, it's a legacy that's not subsumed simply in the revolution against capitalism. I think uh, we are too easily dazzled by the power of capital. I would suggest that my friend Nathan Brown is perhaps slightly dazzled by the power of capital and that therefore we subsume the category of revolution fully within the category of capitalism and the internal contradictions of capitalism. And that I think is, a, is conceding too much to capitalism. Capitalism is a particular mode of production and exploitation, a particularly powerful one uh, for reasons that we perhaps will come back to. But it's not the be all and end all of this story. I certainly share your optimism and, and conviction that it will be overcome and then other problems will arise which will themselves call for uh, a revolutionary solutions uh, in due course, I think. Um, the French Revolution, I don't think, is you can helpfully understand very much of it by simply calling it a bourgeois revolution or reducing it to, to some of the Marxist categories that were used half productively, I think, in the mid-20th mid century by people like Sobul and others. But a, a lot of the recent work on the French Revolution has, I think, quite usefully put that into question. People like uh, Florence Gautier and Sophie Vanek and others have demonstrated that you really don't, you only get so far with those categories. Um, 
So, I, uh, so part of it is continuing, and this, this category of continuing, having to, having to continue and to move forward, was very quickly uh, internal to the sequence itself. So uh, I'll just give you a couple of quotations about this. But that in the French Revolution, we have probably for those, you know, I think in, at least in the broad popular representation of this, there's a, the standard reading of the French Revolution is that it starts pretty well. There's this uh, magnificent moment of uh, utopian principled end of feudalism. For a couple of years, people talk about the honeymoon of the revolution, you might have heard that phrase. And then, for reasons that are a little murky, it all starts to go bad, and by 1792 already, it's frightening, and then in 93, people start losing their heads and it all goes to pot, right? Uh, in fact, though, uh, what happens is that there's a buildup of massive popular pressure um, for different kinds of reasons that explodes after years of building up in July 89 in ways that absolutely terrifies the elite. Uh, you know, the, the, the administration is in, uh, in free fall, they have no idea how to respond, and in terror, they make certain concessions, uh, basically to keep their skins, to, it's an absolute damage limitation exercise. What can we do, particularly in the countryside where farmers, peasants, and so on, are terrifying the local nobles and sacking castles and, you know, wrecking the joint. Uh, and in a context like that, it's we must make some concessions to keep our heads. So they do, they make a certain number of concessions, quite spectacular style, as it turns out, in August. And then as soon as those concessions are made, there is exactly what you predict, an attempt to limit the damage and to basically to avoid implementing them. So martial law is declared, a whole set of stalling tactics are put in place right from September that delay any meaningful implementation. And right away, the people of Paris are caught on to this. And one of the most important and underappreciated episodes of the French Revolution is the March on Versailles, 5th of October, 1789. And if you know the story, uh, 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 about 20,000 plus people from Paris marched out, led in particular by women who were trying to feed their families, to go and get the king and his family from Versailles and bring them back to Paris. And when they come back, and they, you know, it's a pretty dramatic thing. They go fully armed, they burst fully armed into the queen's bedchamber, and this is an almost unimaginable thing. Here's a thing we can't imagine, that's for sure. And the queen has an absolute uh, fit. Uh, and they basically prod her out onto the balcony at, at uh, bayonet point to uh, basically say that, of course, we'll come with you. And they're, stead, you know, they're just waiting for her, basically, with the muskets raised. Um, and they bring them back with a song saying, Nous ramenons le boulanger, la boulangère et les petits mitrons. So we're bringing back the baker, the baker's wife, and the baker's boy. And they have got the king now. So they bring him back. And after that, the king, who betrays the revolution at every point, who conspires with the enemies of the revolution, does everything he can possibly do to undercut it, to limit it, and so on, but his hands are quite effectively tied. He's stuck now in Paris, and the momentum will never, they will never recover it after that. However, that's still only October 89, and uh, at this point, people like Robespierre and Candide de Moulin, who's already writing, they're all very optimistic people. They basically think things are going pretty well, we can work with this monarch now that we've clipped his wings, uh, and we'll be able to have a kind of constitutional monarchy of some kind. That's, that was the agenda for two years. The exception is Marat, Jean-Paul Marat, uh, another underappreciated figure, very hard to find his stuff in English now, there's at least a biography, but no useful collection of his work, uh, who anticipates what's actually going to happen. And if you read the revolution through Marat, you get a much better picture of the actual logic of events, I think. And he says this very quickly, he's already saying this in October, but the clearest version of his basic theme is in July 1790. It's from L'Ami du Peuple, uh, his newspaper number 177, if you want to find it. And by the way, I realized I didn't have... Uh, I didn't um, put my quotes together in a, in a PowerPoint, so it's, it's a, particularly in a, in a foreign language, I realize it's quite hard to, to hear and listen to them. So I can, I can do this and send them to Tom and Vitar later, and, and you can circulate them if you want to put them on the website if people want the quotations. So if you, if you don't have time to write it down, don't worry, or if you, if you want to be able to read it again, I'll send it. But here's what he says in July 1790. He says, it's the height of madness to pretend that people who for 10 centuries have been in a position to rob and oppress us with impunity will simply accept with good grace to become our equals. They will endlessly scheme against us, he says, and he goes on like this, until, until they overcome us, until they suppress us. Uh, and we will not be able to escape civil war, he says, we will wind up by being ourselves massacred unless we, we, unless we take the initiative and secure the victory. So his constant theme is we must do what it takes to secure the victory. We've won some important things. We now need to extract those concessions, turn them into real policies, and complete the job that we've started. So his project is always from that point, 
what does it mean to continue, to make the next step? Uh, and you, one time after another, this is basically what he says. So we find ourselves in a war, we now need, we now need to win that war. What does that mean? Well, we have, to, we have to requisition weapons, we have to mobilize the population, we have to have conscription, etc., etc. We have to deal with, in particular, with the treachery of the generals. This will come back to haunt people like Trotsky and so on, and the Russian Revolution. How do you, we, on, we only have one officer corps, which we've inherited from a regime that despises what we're doing. What do we do with these people? And they have the same solution, by the way, which is take their children hostage. <laughs> um, so Maha, that's basically Mahan's line. Uh, the, the question then of, and uh, maybe I'll give you one other uh, quote, which is, again, important, I think, from Babeuf, who is the person, who is the survivor of the Jacobin sequence. So uh, Maha is killed at the height of the Jacobin sequence in July 1793. Uh, after that, in a sense, things do start to go downhill. Babeuf is the person who survives Thermidor, draws some conclusions from it, and tries uh, uh, forlornly to continue uh, the revolution, but always on the understanding that that is now the agenda. And he says, he says this in the last year of his life, he's killed in 1796. Uh, the revolution is not finished, he says, and it must be pursued until it has become the revolution of the people. Therefore, those who complain about, quote, people who want to make the revolution without end can only be considered enemies of the people and dealt with accordingly, he says. And what does that mean? Well, it means for him now explicitly communism. It means equality, it means dressing, questions around property and division of property, division of labor. It involves the actual concrete remodeling of the economy in line with the principles of equality and freedom. So by both having said that, the revolution is not finished, it must be continued until exploitation, slavery, and so on are fully addressed, and that would include certainly wage slavery and so on. Sets an agenda, I think, for much of the 19th century. On the other side, of course, uh, the right does exactly the opposite and is constantly preoccupied with how to end the revolution. That becomes very quickly, in a sense, the guiding theme of the reaction. What becomes known as, quite literally, precisely the reaction to the revolution is how to end it. So this is the concern of people like Siez and the, the directory of uh, the Thermidorians, broadly, from 1794 and five. It's Napoleon's punchline at the end of his coup d'etat in Brumaire, uh, 1799. He says, citoyen, la révolution est finie, the revolution is over or finished. And it's the theme of, of the rea reactionary historiography ever since, particularly with someone like Furet, François Furet, who exemplifies this and whose influence was really massive, I think, in the, seven, in the uh, late 1970s and 1980s in particular. And the opening section of his book, his main, most important book, I think, Pensée de la Révolution Française, is called The Revolution is Over. And it's all about that. It's essentially trying to argue with people who think the revolution might still be ongoing, particularly in the project of communism, and looks at the, the attempt to continue the revolution in the 20th century now classified under the category of crime. That the crime of the 20th century was to try to continue the revolution under the form of a kind of perverse Jacobin Bolshevik synthesis and what that meant concretely, its actuality, was the gulag. Solzhenitsyn, he says, has opened our eyes and now we can see not only that the Russian Revolution was basically just the anticipation and implementation of the gulag, but so was the French Revolution too, precisely because in a certain sense it anticipated that logic. And therefore we can, we can put an end to that whole miserable illusion that has been the source of all this grief by understanding that that thing is finished and done with, and now we can set about implementing a properly liberal political order. And again, I think you can find different versions of this, uh, that theme. So the, the question of how to, whether to continue or not to continue is internal to the French Revolution, and then it sets an agenda for revolutionary politics uh, ever since. You'll know that you know, 1830, 1848, 1871, each time the leading actors of this thing position themselves in relation to one or another moment of the French Revolution, but of different, and in particular the radical moment, 1792, 93. Uh, uh, so will then uh, position uh, themselves in relation to the commune in very important ways, theoretically and practically. So will people in Shanghai later in 1966 and so on. And there's one other person before I move on a little bit to talk about Rousseau after all. Um, uh, another person I want to put out there as part of this project, the most interesting one for me, partly because I happen to be working on him at the moment and therefore he's in my head, but who I'm becoming more and more interested in is, is Auguste Blanqui, Louis Auguste Blanqui, who in certain, for certain audiences would be a totally unknown figure, so I, I don't mean to insult your intelligence, but I'm going to assume that he's unknown here. I know he's not, probably, for many of you, but uh, Blanqui, certainly in, in the UK, is pretty much as unknown as it gets for a major revolutionary figure. Uh, born in 1805, dies in 1881. 
and Blanqui is, is a BL, A, N, and then Q, uh, U, I, Blanqui. Uh, and he dies, uh, born in 1805, dies in 1881. He comes of age in the 1820s at the height of the, rest, you know, the reactionary moment of the Restoration. And uh, the defining moment for him is 1830, the July 1830 revolution. I'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, and then he's, in some way or another, involved very closely with each of the great revolutionary convulsions uh, right through to the moment of his death. Uh, and he's a highly problematic figure, by the way. I'm not going to go into the, uh, what I think are pretty flagrant, problematic limitations of his position, although I'm happy to do that later. I want to talk about what's interesting and compelling about him uh, instead. Uh, he, he was recognized by Walter Benjamin in particular as the, the great revolutionary authority of the 19th century. Who, and Benjamin is already wondering, you know, why is it that he's been so forgotten uh, in different texts <coughs> of the late 1930s in particular? But he has been well and truly forgotten, and now you have to look quite hard for him, even in France, where which is the exception. Rancière introduced one of his essays, a useful introduction uh, from 2002 called Eternity by the Stars, and it's a remarkable essay for all kinds of reasons. Uh, Daniel Ben Said, in particular, would talk about uh, Blanqui, wrote a piece with Michael Lovey about him, talks about him here and there, but nothing very detailed. Um, also, actually, some of the people involved with Tikkun introduced a, a very useful collection, the, the most useful collection that I know of, uh, called Maintenant, il faut des armes, Now We Need Weapons. Uh, which is a compilation from 2007. There's no compilation in English, though, apart from some pieces that you can find on the Marxist Internet Archive that Mitchell Avador translated. And Blanqui's life, you could, uh, political life, you could summarize as an attempt to continue the revolution as a revolution, meaning continuing something that is changing, that is new, that is innovative, that breaks with the past. So it's a slight paradoxical. To continue the revolution is precisely not simply to repeat the revolution. So he says we're following in the footsteps of Robespierre, but by moving past Robespierre, he becomes, in fact, increasingly critical of that of the sort of high Jacobin moment, more sympathetic to the Ebertists and others, more and more emphatically communist as he gets older. But this is what it is to continue the revolution, is to continue in a revolutionary process of change and innovation. Uh, and for him, uh, the revolution has happened already, it started already. Uh, the renewal of the revolution then, that, uh, that is the July days, 1830, is a demonstration of the fundamental underlying revolutionary dynamic. It happens explosively, unpredictably. It demonstrates that the real power of the situation belongs to the people if they are able and organized and determined uh, to use it. And that this is the fundamental thing, is to either contribute to that revolutionary mobilization of the people or to fight it. And that there are no, there are no alternative positions, there's no middle ground, there's no third way. You either have to align yourself with this, contribute what you can to it, draw the conclusions from the defeats that it suffers, the impasses, the limitations that it is afflicted by, uh, or oppose it. And so he's constantly trying to clarify those fundamental alternatives and to draw the conclusions of what, what it is to contribute to this, what it is to continue to this. Um, he defines the revolution essentially as communism, as the essence of the revolution. Uh, and it allows him to do a number of things by, by emphasizing the, the ongoing continuity of the revolution. First of all, it clarifies your political opponents and alliances. So he says, we've learned some things from the Saint-Simonians, Saint the Fourierists, uh, Fourier other utopian socialists, but when push comes to shove, they're against the revolution. They side up with the status quo. They think the revolution is too negative. They're too much like machine wreckers. And uh, they are they're opposed to us. So he says... Uh, likewise, the people who attack, the, attack communism as the essence of the revolution are also opposed to us. That's the divisive slogan of 1848. On the other hand, you know, who is, who is, uh, it clarifies who is on your side, so to speak. So the revolution is the litmus test of political allegiances. Second, it allows you to connect material interests, the material interests of the people, and high principle. So he says the revolution, what is the revolution if it's not about the material amelioration of the condition of the people, of the masses? Nothing, he says, but that is not to belittle it. The interests of an individual, he says, are worth nothing, but the interests of an entire people raise themselves to the, to the hauteur d'un principe, to the, you know, to, the, to the dignity of a principle. And it's that, the power of principle, the power of equality, freedom, um, solidarity, and so on, that really drives things, that motivates things. So parenthetically, uh, an important difference with Marx, and this is sort of a set piece, the differences between Marx and Blanqui, there's a long literature on this, but that if, if Marx tends, and in my opinion, tends too easily to say that we can read political ideals and political consciousness from material <coughs> situations, Blanqui does, makes the opposite 
in a sense, move and also too f goes too far in the other direction by saying we can read uh, political principles as primary, political consciousness, political education as primary, such that, for example, ignorance is more fundamental for him than poverty. Poverty is an effect of ignorance. It's because people are ignorant and deluded about how they're being exploited that accounts for why they are so poor, for example. And their poverty, in turn, reinforces their ignorance and their impotence. But the first thing to do is to, is to assess how people think, what their ideas are, what their consciousness is, and engage at that level. And so his, his point of departure is through people's consciousness, not through an analysis of social being, for example. So it allows you, continuing the revolution allows you to connect material interests and principle. And he makes no apologies about the importance of, of essentially, the, 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 the moral ideals of the people. If anything, he inflates them and uh, almost deifies them. Uh, third thing, it allows you to combine uh, what, ba what is basically a classic kind of vanguardist logic and mass mobilization. So on the one hand, he says, you know, the, the actor of the revolution is the people, is the, in particular, the, the, the proletariat of Paris. He has, his definition of the proletariat is essentially uh, the people who have to work for others. So it's not, it's not fundamentally that different from Marx's definition, but it's more inclusive. He's not so concerned about, uh, about analyzing the, the forms that that uh, compulsion takes, takes them more or less for granted, uh, and their capacity to organize themselves. So he says, you know, the fundamental thing we learned from the first revolution was the concrete capacity for the people of Paris to organize themselves in sections, you know, the famous sections of Paris, that for a year and a half or so were able to keep, uh, take and keep the initiative in the revolutionary sequence. So it's because the, the Commune of Paris, the first Commune of Paris, and the sections were organized had effective, responsive forms of leadership, were armed, were very, were determined, had a clear agenda that they shared, that they were able to then plan very deliberately and consciously to intervene at critical points, particularly in August uh, 1792 and then at the end of May in 1793, the two probably most important days in the radical revolution, and that that sets the example. What we need, he says, is this. We need the, the faubourg insurgé. We need the, the, the popular neighborhoods with the capacity to organize their own insurrection. That is what will determine uh, the movement of history. But we also need people who have faith in our ideals. And there's a quote here that the Tikkun people make much of. He says, quote, revolutions want people who have faith in them. To doubt their triumph is already to betray them. It's through logic and audacity that one pursues and wins them. The more you lack these qualities, the more you concede to your enemies. And they will see only one thing in your weakness, the measure of their own forces. And their courage will grow in direct proportion with your timidity. So it's that, uh, he, this is the thing he's taking from Rousseau, I think. Uh, he's a, a lot, uh, the necessity for determined, convinced leadership in conjunction with mass mobilization, uh, that, that is the combination that can keep and retain the initiative. It also allows you then to, the, this figure of continuing the revolution, to understand the organization of his own group in terms of trying to, to guard against the, the, the opposite, the, the, attempt, the temptation to give up, temptation, the, the temptations to switch sides, the danger of fatigue, of succumbing to persecution. Uh, Blanqui, as you, will, you may well know, spends most of his life in prison, 33 years of his life in prison, and every single thing that could be done to him is done to him. And right from the beginning, he says, we will never give up. He, he says, during his first trial in 1831, he says, despite all these persecutions and violences uh, that, we, that have been inflicted on us, you know, nous marcherons ferme à notre but. We will march on firmly, unshakably to our goal. We are young, we're patient, we will not give up easily. And he certainly lived, I think, in continuity with that uh, declaration. Uh, and finally, uh, to continue the revolution as the revolution is precisely not to program its course in advance. So he resists every attempt to you know, design the cookbooks for the future, to use the Marxist phrase. He, he has faith, basically, in people's capacity to determine their own future once they've acquired themselves the power to do so. So there are mechanisms that prevent that from happening, in particular, the control of the church, the aristocracy. And for him, the, there's an important continuity between the bourgeoisie and the aristocracy. He says these are forms that have melded into a single form, particularly in rural France. It's not helpful, he says, to, to assume that just because a certain feudal aristocracy has been overthrown, that it hasn't persisted in neo-feudal form in the countryside in particular. Again, or that the way the rentier interests 
the, the high, you know, the high financial aristocracies, and puts it retain a kind of feudal quality in ways that anticipate some work that's being done today. I think. And they control, in particular, the ideological apparatuses of the state, the schools, the ways that people are more or less brainwashed into accepting the status quo, and that that is what we have to break, he says. We need to, for example, eliminate every trace of the religious orders, throw out the clergy, reappropriate all the interests and possessions and properties of the church, never allow a, a priest to enter a classroom, he says. Um, <clears throat> so that's a, that has a kind of program, if you like. But it's simply to clear a space for people to set their own agendas. So he resists every attempt to say, this is what we should do, this is how the future is going to look. Instead, no, we can trust that people have the intelligence, the will, the determination, and so on, to do what is necessary. All we have to do is enable the process uh, to begin properly. So it's not about defining the path, but removing the obstacles that prevent people from walking down it. Okay, so that's sort of, um, what, what I'm going to do now is um, say a few words about Rousseau and perhaps a couple of words about uh, Marx and Lenin and then end with a word or two about Gramsci. And of course that's a bit ridiculous, it's not to, um, to say anything that you won't already know about those characters, but to try, it's the form itself of a kind of continuity, <coughs> to try and say that there's something that I think begins or crystallizes anyway around Rousseau that sets a kind of agenda that, that I think we can usefully see in terms of a continuity rather than emphasizing, say, the breaks and discontinuities uh, through Marx uh, and Blanqui, who of course are very different, but I think are fundamentally best understood as complementing each other, and that then are synthesized in ways by Lenin and by Gramsci, I think. Not explicitly, by the way. It's not that Lenin sets out to say, right, Blanqui here, Marx here, Rousseau there. He hardly ever talks about Rousseau. And when he talks about Blanqui, it's in the usual way to say, I'm not a Blanquiste, I'm not a putschist conspirator. But actually what Lenin's providing, I think, if you read it, if you read it particularly the way that someone like Lars Lee reads it, which I'm pretty sympathetic to, what he's providing is a synthesis of these three positions. And that's what Gramsci's providing too in a slightly different context. So that's what I'll, I'll try and do, and I'll, I'll take another 15 minutes or so, if that's okay. And, um, and I'll end there. So this is very much a sort of sketch. And uh, starting with Rousseau, and again, it's uh, important for me to start with Rousseau because he addresses some abstract fundamental terms, these questions of freedom and equality, for example, on their own terms as principles, and not simply as uh, implications of a critique of something else. In other words, not as something that's like a negation of a negation, but as positive principles. And they're grounded in it's a positive principle itself, which he has this very minimalist account of human nature, but he has an account of human nature, and he says one of the things that we have is the power to be free. We have the power to freely set our own ends, the power as he puts it, to will our own ends, and that this is a banal fact about what human beings are. He says, it's always strange to me to ask why a free people is free. He says, that's like asking why a person has two arms. The question you should ask is, why does a person have only one arm? Or why is a person not free? That's something that needs to be explained. You know, that is a problem. But why a people would be free, if it is free, is something that follows from what we are. We are uh, a creatures who have the have freedom. The right to liberty, he says, is something that we are born with. In that sense, it's a natural right, a natural capacity, more importantly. Um, so he says, freedom is not the problem, necessity or compulsion is the problem. Um, so he's very emphatic about this, particularly in the Emile book. He says, you know, the principle of every action is in the will of the free being. One cannot go back beyond that. It's not the word freedom which means nothing, it's the word necessity. So there's a positive capacity of freedom that is the point of departure. And for him, it's just it's fundamental, consubstantial with what it is to be human. To renounce freedom is to simply renounce being human altogether. Uh, and it, it, it creates a kind of category that is almost unthinkable uh, for him. Extinction of humanity, essentially. Uh, this, this implies two things. Freedom for him means two things, essentially. One, it means autonomy and independence. So the ability to formulate and pursue your own goals that are in some meaningful sense your own, that you've made your own independently of pressure of other wills, the pressure to submit, to conform, and so on. So you're enslaved if you have to obey someone else's will, if you're compelled to do something for somebody else, if you're compelled to work for someone else, for example, that's a form of slavery for him. Uh, if you are in a relation of servitude, that's the source of all evils, he says. The worst that can happen to someone is to find themselves at the, the discretion of another. So you have that theme, partly a classical Republican theme, uh, but he's democratizing it, he's turning it into a popular theme. Um, 
And here I think it wouldn't be hard to make the connection, and Coletti and others have made it, between this emphasis on independence, freedom from dependence on others, and early Marx's emphasis on uh, the way that alienated labor depends on the power that, that can compel it, that's alien and hostile, that's independent of the worker, and that dominates the worker then as the master of that worker. So you relate to this other that upon whom you depend as your master, precisely, in a relation of servitude. And that emphasis on coercion, servitude, dependence that you find in the early Marx is for me the fundamental point of Marx's work, that I would emphasize very much the, the continuity of that theme all the way through his work, the political work, but certainly in the, in the economic writings too, where the definition that he gives very early in 18, already in 1844, emphasized again in the lectures that he gives on wage labor and capital in 47, 48, and then all the way through the economic writings is that what is capital? Capital, the shortest, most important and clearest definition of capital is the command of unpaid labor. That's what capital is. Uh, there are other forms of commanding unpaid labor, but capital is a specific form of the command of unpaid labor, which takes particular forms. And the fundamental thing then is that relation of command. So I, I would say that the, although of course, the analysis of this particular economic forms that it takes dominates Marx's later work once he realizes just how powerful that command is, how it works, in particular through ways that are much more difficult to criticize than, for example, forms of chattel slavery. The, form, the, way, the way that wage slavery works is much more subtle. It works by, uh, uh, by dominating people's wills, precisely. These invisible chains, as he puts it, the golden threads that bind people's desires and wills and makes them oblivious to the forms of oppression that they, uh, that they suffer. Now, he's trying to clarify that uh, expose that, demonstrate what these forms of dependence are so that we can uh, free ourselves from them. Uh, so that's the first, for Rousseau, two, um, two characteristics of autonomy, sorry, freedom. One is autonomy and independence. The other, and perhaps more important, is the sense of positive freedom, the sense of capacity, capability. The ability to do what you will. And this, he says, is crucial. My fundamental maxim, he puts it, and the Emile, is that you, the free person, wills what he can do, she can do, and vice versa. And that that is something that you, this re reciprocal relation between doing and willing is something that you find out by acquiring the capacity uh, to, uh, to do what you will and to will what you do. And we don't know what that is in advance. There's a literal sense here in which we don't know what a will uh, can do. You have to find out, you have to acquire it. And in particular, you have to find it out at the level where it is relevant. So there's the domain of individual will, fine. Rousseau's not particularly interested in that. Much more important is the domain of social uh, and political will, where everything depends then on the capacity to assemble and associate and consolidate collective power, capability. Which for him, the short answer he gives for how you do that is by cultivating virtue, meaning a set of practices that orients individual behavior, wills, desires, and so on for the collective good, for the collective interest, to the exclusion of all those who might seek to exploit or oppress or dominate the collective or people in general. Uh, so it's combative in that sense. And the, the, the whole question for Rousseau is, well, what are we capable of and how can we acquire that capability? Um, and that is the fundamental thing. And I'll just give you a couple of quotes to consolidate this. Um, how can we concentrate our power? How can we associate ourselves, combine our power in such a way as to be able to deal with two basic problems? One, the rich. And second, the instrument we need to beat down the rich. Um, and it really is as simple as that. The, the rich is the kind of catch-all category he gives for those who try to exploit others, whose position and privilege and so on is the consequence of their ability to exploit others. For example, to own property and force others to work on that property or to own the instruments of production and uh, oblige others to use them for their, own <coughs> for their profit. And who are in a position to exploit their strength, the people who the, the rich control the political resources and so on, they are able to form and combine their power in such a way as to be more powerful than the power of the people. That, that is the whole problem. He says, uh, this is in his letter, uh, <coughs> letter from the mountain, the league of the, of the stronger is a natural one, and what constitutes the weakness of the weak is not to be able to league together this way. Such is the destiny of the people. You know, we have, in other words, to find the way to league together, to associate, to combine, to form unions and parties and so on, that allow us to consolidate the power that we need. And he has a pretty striking metaphor for this. This is in the Social Contract, um, Book 3, Chapter 8. He says, 
uh, the more sca you know, tyranny thrives, he says, in the wilderness. It thrives in places where people can be dispersed and scattered, atomized, basically, uh, because then they can't defend themselves. Uh, wild beasts, he says, reign only in wildernesses. And quote, the people's force acts only when concentrated. It evaporates and is lost as it spreads, like the effect of gunpowder scattered on the ground, in which it ignites only grain by grain. So gunpowder, very powerful, if you can put it into a concentrated weapon and use it properly and aim it in a specific direction, otherwise it goes off like a few harmless firecrackers and it causes uh, no damage. So this is the crucial thing. How can we concentrate our forces? How can we become more powerful than the strong? And, uh, and, and that, I think, is the essential question he's asking in this political work. Uh, he, he asks another thing, so I'm going to skip over these points, but he, he considers them, well, how to, how to start, what, the, the, the funny thing about Rousseau is that he's not a revolutionary thinker, I'm mindful of this, in the sense that his political opinions are often actually quite cautious and conservative. He's, his main concern is, once you've established a virtuous state, how to preserve it. You know, the problem is, a, a virtuous state is vulnerable to all kinds of corruption, and it will tend to weaken over time. One of the reasons why is that the instrument it needs to prevail over the rich, to deal with this problem of the exploitative class and so on, uh, is that the instrument that it needs to do that will itself turn into a problem. And, and, and so he has a famous critique of, of the government of the executive. We need an executive. Without an executive, a large number of people anyway can't do anything. But that executive has to remain, has to remain obedient to the power of the people. It has to use what uh, Enrique Dussel calls obediential power. In other words, power that is constantly subordinate to the power of the people. Now, this is, of course, a problem. How do you do that? Uh, and his answer, again, is uh, somewhat anachronistic and unhelpful. Well, you need a very virtuous population. Um, but the problem is a real one. How do you avoid the government turning into a sort of proto-Stalinist bureaucratic nightmare that appropriates and usurps popular power and uses it against it? Uh, Rousseau at least anticipates the problem very clearly. Uh, and, he, and in fact, he sort of sets an agenda for, not for revolutionary action, but in a sense for post-revolutionary action, for action that tries to continue the revolution which is to say, to avoid this impasse, to make sure that you, so he anticipates the measures that the commune will take, and that Marx will emphasize, and that London again will emphasize after them, which is to say that you must make sure that your government, you know, the people who become part of your government acquire no special privileges, are not paid anything more than anybody else, and can be recalled at any point, and are elected at every stage. And as if you do that, for example, then those, those are among, and you have to maintain constantly your, your practices of popular virtue. If you do that, then you can minimize the danger. But he says you'll never get rid of it. There's a structural necessity to this danger, and it's always going to be there. And as soon as you let up, as soon as you assume you can resolve this by some kind of bigger reconciliation, or sort of, sort of end of history narrative, or something like that, then you're finished, and it will just consume you. There is no end of history. There is no shortcut. There is no easy way out to this. You need a government to be able to prosecute you know, your, your, your collective will, but uh, you, you have to keep grip on it. You have to keep control of it. He also addresses importantly, and I won't go into it here, but famously the question of how to start, uh, how a general will can take shape. He's remarkably uninterested in, in, in how you would get to the point where it, where it begins. So the chapter that addresses that in the social contract, which is book one, chapter six, is entirely abrupt. If you know the text, he just basically says, people have reached a point where they can't go on as they were before, right? And it becomes un unbearable, intolerable, and therefore they resolve to form an association that does X, Y, Z. But that's it. I mean, there, and there's nothing else. If you look at the, the discourse on the origin of inequality, for example, there's no account there either. That book ends with a kind of, well, there's an important stage where the rich are getting more powerful and the societies become more unequal. The rich, importantly, consolidate that by having a false social contract, by basically deluding people into accepting this paradigm. And then having done that, it just gets worse. Like after that, society gets more and more entrenched and uh, the, the legal forms of inequality become more interaction more canonical, and he just ends with this sort of impasse. Um, so there is no account of how people arrive at this point, but there is an account of what they will need to make the transition, and he does insist that it is a transition, and this is important, I think, as well, and has been much criticized for it, that unlike, uh, so there's kind of, the, the question is, how do you go from a powerless, divided, politically ignorant, in his own terms, childlike state of passivity, where you have been the, the tool of a powerful class, where you've been you know, the serfs of the aristocracy, where you've been the oppressed poor in an unequal society. How do you go from that, being a, what he calls a blind multitude, 
to being a virtuous people, able to beat the rich and to control the government that beats the rich, right? How do you do that? Uh, and he says, well, it, you, ha you can't just fudge it. You can't just say, well, the people have this innate power, some kind of weird potential power that just has to be actualized, uh, or, you know, as if they're over God on earth as certain versions of um, here's the most you could try to suggest. No, you need a process. It has to happen. It has to happen as an educating process, one in which the distinction between educator and educated is irreducible, but has to be overcome as quickly as possible. And that is his figure of the legislator. He says, for reasons that are pretty similar to Spinoza, before you have political reason, and this is all about how to acquire political reason, how to acquire the virtue that we need, that we don't yet have, you can't put the cart before the horse. You can't presuppose reason and virtue. So you need something that works for the political equivalent of children, meaning religion. You need Religion is the thing that will uh, persuade people before they are reasonable enough to be uh, convinced. Uh, it also, though, uh, the way that he sets this up, it's in, chapter, it's in book two, chapter seven. It's also very clearly, though, uh, it's sort of the opposite of what Feuerbach talks about in terms of projecting uh, uh, our capacities onto a religious figure. Here it's patently human capacities that are at stake, um, quite explicitly so. And, uh, and it's done in such a way as that people can realize as quickly as possible that the power in question here is their own power. And what, what is remarkable, I think, about Rousseau's account is that the figure of the legislator, who initially is like this exceptional person who comes along and says, here's how you should become a virtuous person, a virtuous people, I mean, uh, is that position is subsumed quickly, in fact, almost imperceptibly, into the figure of the people themselves. The, the legislator is ultimately, if you look at the way he writes it, uh, this unique individual who comes from outside and then leaves as quickly as possible, like Hervis or Moses, um, or is killed off or whatever. Uh, and the people themselves, simply. Legislative power is sovereign popular power, and they are essentially the same thing. So the figure of the legislator is subsumed as quickly as possible into the figure of the people. And I think uh, that's basically what Rousseau is trying to argue. Uh, and it leaves, a, it leaves a question, one that you know, Marx argues with in his thesis on Feuerbach and that Kautsky and then Lenin and others uh, uh, address and Blanqui again. The question is, what is political education? How does it, how does it work? How does it operate? Uh, and can we, the temptation to avoid being, you know, the two poles to avoid are one kind of uh, sort of elitist, top-down, dictatorial educator who says, here's how you have to behave. But the other position to avoid is one where you think you can just eliminate the problem and fudge it by saying that the people already know what they want. The people, in other words, the instincts of the people, the reflexes of the people, are themselves adequate to what the will of the people is. And here, Rousseau, I think, makes a helpful distinction. There are always popular opinions, popular reflexes, popular instincts. They reflect the existing configuration of society, which is to say a society structured in dominance and oppression and ignorance. So Blanqui, for example, will very energetically refuse the idea of having snap elections after a revolution because he says they will reflect the pre-revolutionary state of things. The Bolsheviks understood this a little bit late when they realized that you can't have a constituent assembly immediately after taking power. Uh, they would have done better, I think, to postpone it rather than simply abolish it. But uh, the problem is there. So uh, you have, in other words, to have a situation not of indoctrination but of removing the miseducation this is what Blanqui emphasized. It's not about uh, telling people how they have to think. It's about removing the constraints that previously have indoctrinated them. In other words, the power for him, the power of the church. So uh, that's enough. Um, I've read Blanqui, and I'll try and wrap up quickly. I realize I've gone on uh, too long. Uh, Blanqui, I'm afraid I'm going to. I'll just. I'll, I'll skip over him. Um, but uh, I'd love to come back to him. There's really so much to um, to say about him. I'll, I'll, I want to give you a couple of quotes at least. Um, so he, I've talked about how he, he, he sees his position as continuing the, the Jacobin revolutionary project and extending it into a communist project. Uh, his, can, he, there's a, very short, a couple of short texts that you, can, that you can find on the Marxist Internet Archive in French or English, and I would encourage you to look at them. And I'll, I'll just, I'm going to mention two of them. One is a text from 1834 called Qui fait la soupe doit la manger. Whoever makes the, makes, you know, makes the soup should eat it. There's a, there are several versions of this text. Uh, some of them are read more like uh, uh, the social wealth belong, should belong to those who produce it. Um, the basic idea is, uh, it's a kind of potted history, it's a very remarkably compressed account. The best version, unfortunately, is not online, but it's in his oeuvre, uh, uh, volume one. Long these are published in 93, 17, sorry, uh, 1993. And very quickly, what he, did, he outlines a sort of uh, a social scenario that's like this. The point of departure is a version of what Marx will later call primitive accumulation, which is usurpation by rapacious and powerful few of land and by extension the means of subsistence. 
Second, the obligation, because these things are sterile in themselves, he says, and only can be fructified through labor. The compulsion then to oblige other people to work on these usurped possessions, so for the profit of the possessing minority. So he says, such, quote, such is our social order, founded on conquest, which has divided populations into victors and vanquished. The logical consequence of such an organization is slavery, end quote. He then looks at the forms of slavery that we've had to fight with, the running battle of people basically fighting for their emancipation against the various reinventions of slavery. He talks about how, for example, the Haitian Revolution overthrew a certain form of slavery, but another form of slavery was consolidated in its place and is uh, continuing to take shape now as we speak in 1830s France. He says servitude, quote, <clears throat> does not consist solely in being a man's thing or a lord's serf. He is not free who, deprived of the instruments of labor, remains at the mercy of the privileged who are their owners. Uh, and uh, again, this is the theme of his work, that we are compelled, commanded to work for others. How can we overcome that command? We overcome it by educating ourselves, by organizing ourselves, and by acquiring the weapons that we need to fight uh, that command and overcome it. And he says, and this is his wager in a sense, is that we have that power. We've showed it already, we'll show it again. We can infer nothing from the current state of passivity and impotence and resignation. He says, looking around ourselves now in 1834, which itself was a pretty tumultuous year, he says, the riots have died, died, died down, people seem more or less reconciled to the state of things. There's a sort of sullen resignation that is what you observe when you look around you. And he says, but you can infer nothing from that. You cannot draw political conclusions from the current state of passivity. The fact is that people are uh, are simply waiting for and building slowly for the, the moment of opportunity when they will be organized enough to take power, to be strong enough to take power. And at that, when they have a sense of that possibility, when there's a, a chance of victory, uh, and when there's a the prospect of organization, leadership, and so on, that can turn the potential uh, to take power into an, an actuality, make it a project that you can actually participate in, then he says everything changes. You, and that, that is what is precisely unpredictable, can't be calculated, and that we have to have, that is essentially a matter of confidence, uh, that people have this power if they are simply given an opportunity to acquire it. And so he's very insistent then on, it's a situation structured essentially as a, as a form of class war. He says an you know, absolute state of civil war, the war between the rich and the poor. Uh, and it's about winning that war and doing what is needed uh, to win that war. And he says, I'll, I'll, I'll give you one last quote from Monkey from his first trial. Uh, and he's, uh, this is right after 1830. Uh, and 1830, this extraordinary success that nobody expected changed everything for Blanqui. And then he sees the, just like Marat in uh, 1790, he sees the, the fruits of victory being stolen, uh, the new monarchy being set up, new forms of oppression being consolidated, and so on, and people being pushed out in every sense. And essentially, he then draws the conclusion, well, what do we need to do to secure, our, you know, to win again and to make sure that we secure the victory this time? And he ends his, his defense speech with the following lines, uh, accusing his judges, of course, of of being on the wrong side of, uh, of the struggle. He says, you've confiscated the rifles of July. Yes, but the bullets have been fired. Every bullet fired by the Parisian workers is on its way around the world, and they strike without ceasing, and they will continue to strike until not a single enemy of the happiness of the people and the freedom is left standing. So he basically is telling his judges, you know, you're all dead men, essentially, and your days are numbered. Um, for that, by the way, he's accused of being in contempt of court and sent to jail for a year. <laughs> um, and he persists with this logic. So that is essentially, that's what Blanqui will, he will reinvent it, he will judge that, you know, at certain moments you need conspiratorial secret political organizing because you can't organize it publicly. In other times, for example, after February 1848, there are, the, the laws against these things are relaxed, then you can have a public club, then you can push for, you can have public propaganda, you can push for popular organizing in the public. So very similarly to Lenin, you, know, you adjust your strategy to the opportunities that you've got. So I, I'm going uh, to start, I realize I'm going over time. Um, uh, what I would want to do then to, to flesh this out would be to try and read Marx in line with this project, basically. I think you can do that in part. So there are parts of Marx that I think contradict this, that are, in my opinion, too determinist for his own good. There are other parts, though, that I think are much more, that can be uh, combined with this. So you can have a kind of partial and selective synthesis of Rousseau and Blanqui and Marx, and that you can read Lenin and Gramsci as people who contributed to that synthesis. So that's, that's the broader picture of the project. And I'll stop there.